Um, now, the, um, the thing to watch out for is, again, you can't just assume that you're going to do all synthesis problems in the same exact way, because most of them are not about grid yarns. But you can use these same general uh, patterns. OK. Well, let me look, take a look at the alcohol oxidation and reduction handout again. Um, where, where did we start on that page, and where did we go to? So point to where we started. Now, did we start with an aldehyde or a ketone? A uh, ketone, because the carbonyl carbon is attached to two carbon chains. And then we did get a tertiary alcohol, right? All right, and then you can see from the handout, how do you synthesize a tertiary alcohol from a ketone? Well, you need R minus. And the whole part here, the only hard part was figuring out what form should the R minus take. The hard part was to get the right carbon chain for that R minus. OK. Now, um, and when it when it says down here, the H H minus, yeah. So it also shows how you can go to the left using H minus. We didn't even talk about that today. Is that important? Um, that can certainly come up. Yeah. So, um, so let's say that we're starting, say, with a uh, aldehyde. Um, so, or we're actually, we're starting with the ketone here, right? So we're starting with this ketone, uh, and then we can add R minus to reduce it, right? Now, notice that the R minus doesn't just reduce the ketone. It also adds more carbons. What, what if you wanted to reduce the ketone without adding more carbons? Well, then you'd want to add H minus, not R minus. So you can see that from the ketone, you can move to the left either by adding R minus or H minus. They're both going in the reduction direction. But um, this would be secondary because the ketone here, the carbonyl carbon is attached to two carbons. So if you add a new carbon, it becomes attached to three carbons. But if you just add a hydrogen, it's not attached to more. Um, so if you add a source of R minus, the ketone gets one more carbon and becomes a tertiary alcohol. But if you add a source of H minus, the ketone um, contains the same number of carbons uh, and just turns into a secondary alcohol. And what are the sources of H minus? Well, that's on the bottom of the page. You can use sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. I think you've seen both of those reagents in class. Um, they make, so these work pretty much very similarly to the grid yarns. Uh, and you can see those at the bottom of the page too. Just like grid yarns give you an R minus, Lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride give you the H minus. Mm -hmm. um, lithium aluminum hydride has to be used in two separate steps, just like the grid yarns, where you do the aqueous workup with H2O plus second. Turns out that sodium borohydride, um, you can put the proton in in the same step. So sodium borohydride is usually used just with an alcohol, and the protonation uh, happens in the same step. But otherwise, that those are all pretty similar to each other. So yeah, that's an important, like another important part of the table. Sure. So I can show you how that would work. I did a lot of problems with last night, but I'm not sure if I understood them. I can start with the same starting material we just had. Now, if you look up aluminum in the periodic table, you'll see that aluminum is, I guess, in the third column. It's underneath uh, boron. So remember that boron, when it's neutral, has an incomplete octet. When boron is neutral, let's think about that. When boron is neutral, has an incomplete octet. So these would be their neutral forms. So if you add an extra hydrogen, um, that turns out to make them negative. That's why these are called hydrides and not protons. So here's the form that these take. And of course, when something has a charge, um, we have to show a counter ion. So here, we usually use a lithium counter ion. And here, we usually use 
a sodium counter ion. So isn't the opposite? I'm sorry, you were saying it was the opposite? Yeah. It sure is. Yeah. So I messed that up. This should have been usually a sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. Okay, so here's the reagents we use. Now, even though the negative sign is on the boron and the aluminum, these still end up being sources of H minus. These give us hydrogen nucleophiles. These give us hydrogen nucleophiles, just like Rityards give us carbon nucleophiles. So the key thing to keep in mind, maybe we should just memorize, these give us hydrogen nucleophiles. It makes sense that these are nucleophilic because they have negative charges. Um, but uh, it might seem like it should be the boron and the aluminum that are the nucleophiles. Maybe we should just memorize then, since, since we don't have time to go through the logic today, that it's the hydrides, the hydrogens, that are the nucleophiles. Okay? All right, so the way this would work Seen so, so who's going to be the nucleophilic atom here? The hydrogen. the hydrogen, not the aluminum, despite the fact that it has the negative so charge. It's going to attach to the carbon, the neo carbon. That's right. But where should we put the tail of the arrow then? At the hydrogen. Like this. Let's think about that for a second. All the nucleophiles that we've seen both so far donated their lone pairs, right? All the nucleophiles that we ever saw so far were really donating lone pairs. But hydrogen doesn't have any lone pairs, right? So where is the hydrogen going to get the electrons to donate from? What electrons does the hydrogen have that it can donate? The only electron that the hydrogen has is the electrons that the hydrogen is sharing in the bond with the aluminum. So the tail of the arrow has to be coming from the bond. The tail of the arrow has to be coming from the bond um, to show that this is where the hydrogen is getting its electrons from. This is something we haven't seen before for a nucleophile. All the nucleophiles that we saw previously, um, they were donating their lone pair. So you can't just uh, draw an arrow from the aluminum to the hydrogen and then draw an arrow from the hydrogen to the carbon? You mean like this? Yeah, that seems logical. That's actually not a terrible thought process because that shows you how you get the hydride. But um, you actually probably would not get full credit for that mechanism because it makes it seem like there's just H minuses floating around and you really don't have spare H minuses. So it's usually not drawn that way. That, that's kind of logical. That's kind of what we did. That's kind of what we did with the grid yards. Yeah. We kind of, uh, so with the grid yards, we actually write the grid yard as R minus. We actually write that way. But people don't usually write this as H minus. Maybe they should. Uh, but conventionally, it's not drawn that way. Um, so instead, so again, think about how the nucleophile that we saw previously worked. Previously, when we had a nucleophile, we always showed the electrons coming from the lone pair. However, hydrogen doesn't have any lone pairs. So here we have to show the electrons coming from the bond. This is all stuff that maybe should just be memorized on flashcards. You don't have to figure it out from scratch every time. So the hydrogen, the only place you can get the electrons from is this bond. Okay, now that I put in the electron pushing arrow, we should be able to draw the product from this. Um, and of course, that has to kick this up over here. So let's try drawing what the intermediate would look like from this step. Take your time and make sure you draw the right intermediate there. Ah, you got it. Good. Okay, so as usual, I'll start at the tail here. We've got the lithium. Aluminum, H3. Now the aluminum is losing its bond to the hydrogen. And who's the hydrogen forming the bond with? Well, this carbon over here. Call this the number one carbon. And who's the number one carbon bonded to? Well, one ethyl group, another ethyl group, and now this oxygen over here. Uh, so let's see. Who's losing the electrons at the tail? Well, it's the aluminum that's losing the electrons. The hydrogen is not losing them, it's just uh, forming a new bond with them. It's the aluminum that's actually losing the electrons, so it goes from negative to neutral. And that means we can't have the ionic bond here anymore. Well, the oxygen is gaining the charge, and so as you figured out, the counter ion should go over here. 
All right, and then we have ALH3 over here. Okay, um, and then we might as well finish up with the last step here. Do you have to run, or can you uh, spend the last five minutes? You have a couple more minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the head should be pointing at the oxygen, not at the positive charge. That's the red arrow. 